doing it more as a lifestyle change, right? It, and for me, building in public is not a tactic. It's not a hack. It is a way of life. And today we have a superb guest on the show. So hi, KP. In your Twitter handle, you are dubbed as the build in public guy. So I'm very curious. How did you get started with building in public? Hey, everybody. Um, and thanks, Rohi, for having me. So, I mean, it, it, it all started in 2018, um, almost uh, serendipitously or accidentally, where I was, I mean, my original intention was to build uh, a no-code project um, and put it on Twitter and kind of do this over time, over and over again. Um, and so I, I built this project called do things that don't scale.com, which still exists, and I uh, wanted to get feedback from people how they felt, what I can add to it, and how it can make it better. So I put it on Twitter, and then I got instant feedback from other you know, founders and makers. So I thought this was fun, and I was surprised that I didn't notice this phenomenon, phenomenon before, and I didn't really, really try it before. So I was like, this is great. I'm going to uh, keep building no-code projects and putting them in public, as in putting them on Twitter. At the time, I had 414 followers. Now I have 32,000. But it's funny, because even at that small scale, it, it felt like there was a constant feedback loop and I decided I'm going to just, you know, continue building like this. And I built over the course of, you know, the two years, I think I built about 15 projects, everything in public, like even from the moment that I have an idea, even from when, when I'm purchasing a domain, um, my decisions around what I would put on the landing page, how much should I charge? Everything was done, like almost my decision making was done in public by taking people's inputs and, you know, eventually people started calling me the building public guy and like, you know, almost as a tongue in cheek reference, because I was always doing this. And I realized that there's a whole movement, um, you know, of building builders who are building in public. And I became, you know, active in there. I tried to add value and, you know, connect people in that movement. And over time, I became a, you know, one of the leading voices there. Um, but I, as a practice, I think building in public has been around for more than like six or seven years. So it's not new, but I think it's caught a really exciting energy now. Yeah, fantastic. I loved your points on how you kind of surrendered started on Twitter and then you kind of used it to as a kind of feedback loop for yourself and then how you became over time involved in the building in public movement. So I wanted to ask you if you could share any frameworks about using VIP not just to secure podcast guests as I've seen you done on your Twitter, but also as any frameworks as well on how to create content using the BIP mindset. I think the biggest shift um, I encourage all the listeners um, to um, consider is um, pursuing it more as a lifestyle change, right? It, and for me, building in public is not a tactic. It's not a hack. It is a way of life. And and that's why I was able to pull off so many other things that were beyond the initial use case I was using before, which is the no code, right? I was using it for my podcast guests. I was using it now I'm writing a book. I mean, I used it to pitch myself in public and get a book publisher, you know, on Twitter. And so many things, right? I mean, um, numerous number of things. I can quote uh, examples where I used building public. So I think the biggest shift um, happens when you realize that building in public is not a tactic or a hack, but it is a way of life. And then you start to um, get creative and, and, and apply the core principle behind it, which is, you know, um, you know, if you have an ask, if you have um, a particular thing that you want um, somebody on the internet to help you with, especially, you know, especially in a niche to help you with, the, the formula is being very vocal, public, and open about what you want and uh, making sure that you have enough social capital uh, behind your ask. So what I mean by social capital is that you must have enough reputation or trust, built up trust or attention you know, in that particular niche or in that particular market segment for them to react to your ask or your offer. Otherwise, it's just going to be, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be just diluted away or drifted away in the stream of infinite content that goes on on the internet. So anyway, that's the core principle, right? And it's it's a it's harder if you don't understand the principle and like you try to like hack it because you know people can see through that, and um, you would just kind of you know, run into so many rejections and it's going to dishearten you and you're never going to try building in public, you know, because you're like, I'm not getting the feedback loop and I'm not getting people to do what I want them to do. 
um, what is going on? And you get into this whole cycle of like, am I not good enough? Is this not good enough? And I think that's all, you know, um, unhealthy and not, not productive. The real question you should be asking is, it's not about self-worth. It's about have I earned their trust and reputation and, and attention yet? In many cases, the answer is no, and that's okay. You know, early on, you may not have earned that trust from this community or audience, but if you can change that, you can fix it by giving more value, by being prolific in the way you keep giving value and creating content and helping people. And over time, you know, that compounds and suddenly you become such an authority figure, such an expert, such a loved, beloved um, voice in the community that they can't help but help you some awesome points and I think the biggest takeaways for the audience today are being open being public and having some social capital behind your ask so my next question is so how do you kind of build this social capital it can happen in many ways right the the um the crux of it is you how do you build trust and attention with someone like attention is basically by showing up every single day right? Like if my face is visible to you and familiar to you, you know, for, I don't know, a year, you know who I am by default. It's kind of like how all the celebrities in Hollywood, like how, how does Chris Evans or how does, um, you know, I don't know, The Rock, you know, or who's, who's a big holiday Hollywood celebrity, how is he famous in like a small village in India, right? Because he shows up on that channel every single day. Maybe there is a movie that they're playing every weekend or something. And so they, the familiarity aspect I think was hard for me to understand uh, in the beginning because I thought maybe I should not show my face. Maybe I should be like a mysterious and like some anonymous account. But in, in sales, they say like people need to like you. And the way they can like you is if you don't have any, any um, you know, if you're being authentic, right? You don't have a show. You're not putting on a show. You're just being yourself. And, um, and you're being authentic and you're trying to, you know, be fi- like, create familiarity with your audience or community over time. So what happened, like a light bulb went off in my head when I realized this discovery, I think 2019, because until then I was just like, you know, I didn't show my face. I didn't do podcasts. I didn't do um, YouTube videos or I didn't do any appearances because I was like, who's going to listen to me? Who's going to see my face, right? And, but I'm like, no, it's not about me. It's, it, why am I thinking the whole concept is about my beauty or my face? It's not about me. It is about them. It is about the audience and how can I show up for them? You know, being, bring my authentic self. I am the Indian, you know, guy who lived in India, born and raised in India for 20 years and then moved to the U.S. I'm an immigrant in the U.S. now for 10, you know, I think 11 years. That's my authentic story. And I will sound like this. I will look like this. You know, I'm not, you know, Robert Downey Jr. I am who I am. And I started taking pride in understanding that I am meant to be who I am. And I, if I can bring myself authentically to my community or the audience on the internet and show up every single day, you know, with my face or with me or with my content and say, here's what I'm here to add value for. And those micro content value um, that you do every single day over time, over the course of two years, compound so much. And suddenly, like, you know, again, over, over the course of time, you become such a prolific expert that everybody wants to talk to you or everybody wants a meeting with you. Everybody wants a piece of, you know, you and all that. So I think that's familiarity, right? That's how you build like familiarity slash, you know, consistency and showing up um, in one part of it. The other part of it is, so I talked about attention. It's like a coin. The one side of it is attention. The other side of it is trust. Trust is harder than attention. I could like create a scheme or, you know, say something controversial on Twitter and create attention, right? For example, if I said something stupid or a racist or something dumb, of course I have the world's attention, but is it good attention? It's not because you only just have one side of the coin, which is attention, but you don't have trust. Nobody will ever trust you to come on a podcast or nobody wants to be inspired by you. Nobody wants to learn from you because you're an idiot. You just made a fool of yourself. The trust piece is where it takes real authentic patience, but like genuine care for your audience and community. If you can bucket all of the community and audience into, let's say six people around you on a dinner table and say, how can I show up every day? And what can I add value to these people? It is not complicated. The value can be something as simple as creating a curated list of, for example, I'm in the no-code world, curating a small list of top no-code tools that people can use. 
or here's a new no-code tool that I discovered on Product Hunt. I played with it. I made a two-minute video. Check this out, my community. And so basically keep offering value and a value and giving without any expectations. Now that's the hard part. A lot of people give because they want to manipulate them into buying a product or buying something eventually. But it's a short-term tactic. You know, just like how you would not expect things from your family members. You just do it because it's the right thing to do and you're selfless at that point. Do the same thing. And that's how you earn trust. Because people will remember you as the guy or gal who followed through on the promise. If you say you're going to do X, do it. And be reliable and be honest, be candid. Um, and, and, and just give value without expectation. So that will compound as well. And the combo of attention and trust is to me, social capital. Over time, this builds and builds and builds. And like I said, it opens many doors. A lot of people will want to work with you. A lot of founders want your investment. If you're an investor, it's going to change your life. That's what changed my career, in my view. Well, to be selfless and as equating to trust and then attention and trust is equal to social capital. So my next question is, so in your kind of narrative today, you kind of discussed a bit about immigrants in America and how you were also an immigrant into America. So my question for you is, so how can immigrants in America be better supported by policy infrastructure and um, just by the community? Yeah, great question. I mean, I think there, there are a lot of efforts in that area trying to, to, to help immigrants um, you know, assimilate better in, into the country and and, um, you know, I think there's a whole wave of immigrants every year coming in, you know, through as students, as I know you referred to earlier, Ruhi, that you're a student here in the U.S. And I was a student here, you know, uh, 10 years ago on, on an F1 visa. Um, so I think there's a, there's a lot of infrastructure that's, you know, existing, but I think it could be much better. It could be much bigger. It could be much more welcoming in the sense that the paperwork and the loops and hoops that you have to go through to really contribute back into the American economy after you graduated college is ridiculous. And, and I feel like the, the options on the table were when I, at least this is 10 years ago, the options on the table were like just H1B visa, like get a job. But once you got a job, you couldn't do side hustles. You couldn't like, you know, you, you couldn't like try out different experiments and business ideas and eventually leave this job to go get on that, you know, new startup. And I feel like that's very limiting because this in, in this generation is the generation of entrepreneurs, right? We're not the nine to five, um, you know, clockwork, um, you know, um, office workers anymore. That was the previous generation. This current generation is filled, brimming with ideas, brimming with new startup, you know, concepts. They want to create new technology. And I feel like the current visa system is still outdated and antiquated that they're still viewing them as, oh yeah, you got an H-1B at Deloitte or you got an H-1B at, um, I don't know, Delta Airlines, which means that's it. That's all you should do. You know, you cannot do any side projects, you know, cannot create a, you know, a podcast or you cannot create like something that would make even a cent, right? Because um, they're so afraid. That feels like such a zero-sum game. And they're so afraid that you're going to take away jobs from the native uh, citizens or Americans. And I feel like that's such a zero-sum way. I think immigrants and citizens should view being together as a positive some way. What can we achieve, you know, things um, when we are combined, when we're blended? That's how you see the NBA, you know, or any of these great athlete programs are like NBA doesn't, is not afraid of the three immigrant players from, you know, Africa, or like, you know, let's say we have the, right, right now we're talking about uh, Mavs, you know, which is the NBA um, Western Conference Finals team. Dallas Mavericks and their top player is um, Luka Doncic, who is an immigrant from Slovenia. And so Steph Curry, who's an American citizen playing, you know, on the other team, which is Warriors, um, is not concerned that like he's taking a job away from another local player. Like that's bullshit. Like you never even think about it that way in the in the sports arena. However, when it comes to economy and jobs, somehow we feel like jobs are just a finite number of jobs, and they're they're going to be taken away by some other people if they're like, you know, if you're not letting, you know, if you're letting people like, you know, get visas that are more favorable to, to other projects and side households and like other things. So I feel like it's, there's a lot can be done. I feel like the fundamental first principle that needs to be fixed is the mindset, which the lawmakers and the citizens, I think should 
come come to the table thinking it's a positive sum and not necessarily it's a zero sum which means like you know we're going to displace some jobs from americans you know i feel like if you know the stats like more immigrants in america have created jobs in the last 10 years than um leaving you know 50% of all start, your startup unicorns were founded by at least one immigrant so i mean it's just a hilarious thing to me and i'm hoping and rooting for a, a big change and i know if i can play a small role there you know i will want to awesome i think your insights were great so now i wanted to kind of pivot into the tech slowdown and how do you break into the market is it still possible and uh, where it's a great question i think um the market conditions will vary you know um i mean that's outside of your control outside all of our control um it 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 wanes and you know it has its own like uh ebbs and flows right um and you know it is down the funding rounds are down i feel like the 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 capital is frozen at least for the moment but we've seen this you know movie before we've seen 2008 and 9 we've seen 1999 2000 the dot com bust so you know everything that um that um slows down will have to accelerate again and some of the best companies in the world were started during the uh the downturns so this is actually a ripe fertile ground um uh, for you know real entrepreneurs and real founders if they have a compelling idea i think this might be a great market to get in because you're not faced with a lot of um noise and a lot of unnecessary competition um you know because people are being much more cautious so i think that's one thing as a founder now as an employee you can still break into tech cuz you know um there are hiring people are always hiring great talent um it may you may be you may have to work harder to get into the companies as opposed to like i think like a year ago everything was on a hiring spree everyone was on you know a crazy hiring spree and now maybe you'll have to prove your merit a bit more maybe like you know come up with um you know uh, unconventional ways of standing out and doing your research and genuinely doing some of the work that you want to do for a particular startup ahead of time like you know create a notion doc and document like five to six ideas that you would bring to that particular job if you were hired and you know send that over in your first meeting you know with the hr person or whoever you're talking to so basically like tactics and and things that will make you stand out are just pure um you know hunger and uh perseverance and more importantly like putting in the work you know now is the time to you know earn your job as opposed to someone handing it to you so easily so i think that's a um uh, that's a mindset shift as well i think your point on earning your job was very powerful so earlier you had discussed about how you were going to write a book so i wanted to kind of get your take on writing a new york times best seller and what's the power of manifesting and build i so this all came about because i had a um i had a I, i don't know this was after me leaving on deck and uh i was just relaxing and um it was so serendipitous i think one night i think i was taking a shower this is super candid and random but it was one night i was just taking a shower and i it just hit me like a lightning it just hit me that hey you know this is probably a great time for me because i'm between jobs and um and i probably will never have this free time that i have in the future and eventually i want to start a startup or something in the future so i might get busier and busier so what could i do now in this window of time um that i would never be able to do in like 5 years later and i thought writing a book and i thought wow you know i have this topic called building in public and i've been talking about it for four i mean 3 years and hundreds of workshops podcast interviews threads i've done so much content on this i'm like you know what if it would be so cool if i accumulated everything and you know and organized it in a easily digestible way for an average person in america or in the, around the world to get to understanding um what building in public is and i thought maybe i should write a book and so that's it i just came out out of the shower and i you know put it in my um phone i mean the uh, in my phone that i'm going to write a book and so next day morning i woke up and tweeted about it saying um you know i'm going to um i'm i'm going to manifest a book out of a tweet so the tweet was that i'm going to write a new york best seller book um and here's the thesis and there was like you know four or five three uh, tweets around what the thesis is what the book is about who it serves its founders and entrepreneurs and i actually at the time did not have a book publisher 
because you need a book publisher if you want to like get you know get printed traditionally and uh, my call to action towards the end of that my ask of the thread was connect me with any book publishers you may know or tag tag somebody who may you you may want to see working with me and so on and within 3 days i got like lots of leads and you know within a week i got my i haven't signed it but i got like a very very strong lead that you know i think i'm going to work with you know with that person so it's again fabulous how powerful twitter is how powerful um building in public is when you when you're being honest and open and uh, the the manifesting part is you know i feel like a lot of these things you know when you have a very clear ambition and when you vocalize it um you kind of use that as your accountability device that's how i think about it um and now i'm going to work my ass off to make sure that i sell enough copies so that i i, I help enough people that it 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 becomes a new york bestseller right and it's very hard like it was very ner- i was very nervous the night before to tweet about it cuz i was like what if i fail what if i look like a fool you know what if like it doesn't happen and but i thought the upside of this happening is far more powerful and life changing career changing than the downside of this not happening you know who cares if it doesn't happen no one's going to come after me right like it's not like a real bad thing it just i failed it's okay you know and also it's a way to normalize failure um so that's it wow that's awesome kind of how everything came full circle for you with manifesting everything and now you might be getting into new york times bestseller that's amazing so i think some of the big takeaways for audience today is upside and manifestation and twitter power of twitter so i was wondering if you could kind of share your take on what's the power of twitter and how to create opportunities and kind of what was your experience like growing on twitter and how did you build that initial kind of circle of support the, the thing with twitter um is i think i have to wonder if it's the same with youtube too um or any other platform too but the first thousand is the hardest the first thousand followers um is the hardest and it's almost unfair like why that's so hard you know um but that's how it is um and so in the beginning you are you know you you also are a little too much in your head in your own head so you're overthinking everything you say you just don't have that ease you don't have that conviction and this and the and the and the finesse you know like the the smooth um you know style in the beginning cuz you're just so like nervous about impressing people or like trying to say the right thing and getting value out there um so my first i think my i probably took two and a half years or something to get to 1000 1000 followers it was so freaking hard and the 1000 to 10000 was less hard um compared to the first you know one but it was still it did so my i remember like almost two years i, I think it was 1000 followers i was still creating a lot at the 1000 follower mark i think i took an intentional decision this is like july 2020 where i said i'm going to go supernova on this because i know what's working i know my voice my voice and my niche is no code and building public and founders so i'm going to like i've been creating like maybe you know three tweets a day or maybe like on a, on a on a weekly basis maybe like 15 tweets a week or something that was my cadence at the time and i thought why am i limiting myself with an artificial limit like who says that i have only i can only create 15 otherwise they're going to unfollow the ones who are going to unfollow me will unfollow me anyway so i went super nova i decided to go like to the fourth gear you know in a metaphor, metaphor, metaphorical way and i started creating 15 tweets a day and i just started using a notion as a document hub and i created all my ideas there and i would have like a note taking system so anytime i saw something interesting that would be useful for my audience i would like document it and then i started like going super hard on it a lot of people were commenting they were like kp you're like on fire and i was like yes i am on fire cuz i know what i'm doing now and from there i think it still took it still took almost like 7 months 8 months to get to 3k almost like another 6 months to get to 5k and then everything started falling in place once i got to 5k 6k from there i was at a whole new level in terms of even my ease of use i became much more high conviction confident that i didn't care about one or two missed tweets i only focused on the one or two great tweets each week and i just kept going after i still was doing like 15 or maybe 10 each day on average and i got to 10k easily and then from 10k to 20k very easily from 20k to 30k was the easiest like i slept uh on one weekend night and woke up next to money i had like 3000 followers and it's so unfair that's the whole point of what i'm trying to say it's so unfair at the end when you're making these thousands and thousands of followers with like no effort 
in the same way it's so unfair in the beginning where you're trying so hard and yet you only get like 40 followers that weekend but that's how it is set up and i wish i knew the story and the secret you know when i started because i would panic less and i think i would enjoy my scenic route of getting to where i am now with with, with much more chill i'm trying to apply the same lessons on youtube by the way um I just started my YouTube channel. I have 71 grand followers. That's it. And it's, it's it feels like I'm speaking into the void. It feels like nobody's listening. It feels like I'm trying too hard. And I think I'm trying to remember my own lessons from Twitter is that, hey, in the beginning, it's supposed to be hard. That's why millions of people don't do it. You know, think about how many people actually are creators on YouTube. Very less, you know, and same thing with Twitter. So I'm trying to get past the first thousand on YouTube. It may take a year, a year and a half if I can be patient because I know once I get to like the thousands, the ROI at the end is also unfair. And I'll get like, you know, 40,000 or something on, on a month's time at the end. So trying to remember those lessons and apply it in the new platform. Examples were great. And I think you are a good example of how if you double down on your niche and you set a frequency, you can definitely achieve a lot of success in the platform that you're trying to tout. So my next question is, so what's your take on unexamined self-talk and journaling? Like you'd mentioned today that before you came on the podcast, you had dabbled a bit in journaling. Yeah, I. Uh, it's a great question. I, I used to journal frequently back in the day, maybe like 2018 time when I read the book called Atomic Habits. And it was one of my atomic habits each day. I'm less frequent now because now, you know, uh, my, my schedule is a little, um, has been um, up and down, given that I have a newborn, um, one-year-old kid. And I just got off. I mean, I was at on deck. I was just, you know, all over the place. And um, so slowly getting back on the on the track of habits and since maybe like 15 days i've been journaling again almost consistently every day and i realized like when i sit with the journal and intentionally decide to write one page of something it doesn't have to be anything sometimes i you know this is sound it's gonna sound super weird sometimes i sit there and write i love myself i love myself and i love myself and so on and so hard to actually say that out loud uh, both to you now on this podcast, but also even in the book, because we have so many limiting thoughts and self unexamined self-talk that is trying to like be a negative critic and say, why would you love yourself? Like, are you so vain? Are you so narcissistic? Or do you, don't you know your flaws? Like, what are you talking about? What is great about you to love yourself and stuff like that. But when you, when, when I also write, like, I love my son or love my wife that I don't look at, I don't think about their flaws. I don't think about, you know, any of the other things. And so I realized that, you know, this is actually a harder challenge and I need to ground myself to this truth that, you know, there is this chatter in my head that goes on. Despite all my success, there's always this chatter that goes on that says you're not enough. You can be content. You can be patient. You can be great, grateful. And my daily struggle is to sit there and fill up that page with words of affirmations and words of like, you know, kind, um, love, et cetera to battle that negative self-talk and basically kind of clear out my, you know, mind's inbox because it filled, it's filled with spam like this. And so by the, by the 15 minute, 20 minute mark, I actually start feeling better. I started, I start feeling, you know, much more grateful content. And sometimes I write a list of things I'm grateful for. And like, it's a giant list of 15, 20 people, pretty things. Sometimes I make a list of key wins I had since a decade. The, the other thing, funny thing is sometimes you sit there and I write, okay, small wins I had since yesterday or whatever. And my brain's always, it's got recency bias. It's always showing me, I got nothing from last day. You got nothing, man. Like, why are you? There's not much to celebrate. But then I zoom out and add perspective and say, let's make a list of all the things that I've, you know, all the wins I had since a decade, right? The whole 10 year span. Then do you have so many wins, including like the fact that I got my green card, the fact that I have my son now, the fact I got my job at on deck and the fact that I have Gary V on the podcast and so many more things. So I then like get happier. So, you know, I think the practice of doing it, I think is, is um, so effective and I recommend it to all the listeners. It sounds goofy and sounds, you know, kooky when I say it out loud that I write, I love myself on a, on a, on a piece of paper, but you know, there's some truth to it. There's some uh, internal struggle to it. If you really sit down and do it. Yeah, that was fabulous how you shared about your own story with journaling and the power of journaling with the listeners today. 
So um, my last question is, so what are you bullish on currently? I am bullish on the creator economy. I think um, we're going to see a lot of creators um, who will continue to add value and, and build businesses around them. Um, I think the, the word creator is a little misleading. I think it's more like an expert economy, in my view. Like you have to be an expert to... Uh, uh, to be able to create a business. Because like I said, creators sometimes means you just have the attention, right? Creators sometimes feel like the word really is referring to influencers, right? Like people on TikTok or Instagram or some Twitter influencers. But nobody will pay a dime if you just have attention. People want attention and trust, like I said. Um, to me, those two are basically expert. You know, when you become an expert, you have those two um, and you have social capital, you have an audience. So I think that is a huge opportunity there. Uh, I'm trying to do it myself. I'm trying to create Gumroad products. I'm trying to create, you know, um, my Twitter, I mean, YouTube channel and all these things. A lot of this, I want to do it for free. And maybe some of them I'll do for, for paid, but that's that's all that's all uh, I, I, I want to do for a big chunk of my next decade. So that's what I'm bullish on. And, you know, um, we'll, we can... Talk about other things later. Wow, that's awesome that how you're like so embedded in the creator economy and you have such a strong voice in the building and public movement. And I'm really excited for your new New York Times bestseller book. Now, just a small request. If you enjoyed today's episode, please rate and review the podcast in Apple Podcast. Or if you're listening on Spotify, make sure you follow there, subscribe and share the podcast with other people. Hope you learned something new today and looking forward to connecting next week.